part is that that is very serious. You two have missed the announcement, okay? Make sure you know. <laughs> What I, what I want to do is, I think, given that this is really Friday and it's the last lecture, uh, I'll just speak for as, as much as I have to say, and then we have questions at the end, and that's it. Let's not do it in two parts. I think it's going to be probably less than an hour anyway. I think we can do this in one go. And then uh, this gives us enough time to uh, dress up and put makeup on and do whatever. <laughs> I need some time for that. That's good. Okay. Anyhow, like I said yesterday, it's it's a uh, it's a nice topic to uh, wow, that's interesting. It's a nice topic to close um, the lectures with because it talks about the unity of um, of physics in many ways, and it takes this approach of uh, of saying is there a is there a is there a um, is there a simple way of uh, of connecting many disciplines in physics by using this uh, notion of information um, and and maybe limiting how much information you can you can gain gain in some sense and it's really surprising always to see that the different areas of physics are really connected even though they are they come from completely different uh, um, scenarios. So, for example, what I'll be using is is really the fact that you cannot increase the entropy of a closed system and this was this came from um, from the age when people tried to build uh, steam engines and, uh, and convert heat into work and then move faster. Uh, but, but we know that this kind of connection between information and work is also something that led to reversible computing and lots of co uh, ideas be behind quantum computation. So somehow we can apply this stuff to the completely new technology which didn't even exist then and no one had a clue that it would work that way. It's always mysterious to know that this, uh, that this works this way. So let me give you a brief outline of the, of the things I want to mention. It's really just uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a few cute examples. Uh, and, and I think these are things that, that I think I personally at least like to think about uh, at night, like I say. This wouldn't be necessarily the mainstream research. For some people it is. But I bet you uh, quite a lot of money that you won't be able to squeeze this into, into prominent and visible high-level international journals, always. Because some of these ideas are considered speculative, maybe, and uh, you know, not entirely uh, proven and so on. But I think this is really what gives us the spiritual component as, as physicists to go on and enjoy our, our studies of nature. So I think that's kind of, in some sense, much more fun than many other things that are more applied. So what I, what I really want to cover are, are the following things. So here is this taxonomy of, so what I'm really going to go is through various proposals um, to beat the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, so in a sense, what I'm going to try to do is use certain amount of information to convert it into work. And this amount of work is going to be something that's larger uh, than, than allowed uh, uh, in thermodynamics. And you see, thermodynamics has this um, generality in the sense that it's very independent of the underlying microscopic physics. So thermodynamics is the only theory that didn't have to be modified after relativity and after quantum mechanics. It just survived. It's exactly the same thermodynamics. Everything else had to be relativized and had to be quantized, but thermodynamics is just the same old thermodynamics. So that's the power of that. And that's the hope sometimes that maybe when it comes to quantum gravity, we'll also have to obey this kind of general laws. So maybe they're telling us something about what we should be doing. So I'll show you about um, uh, gravitational machines in some sense, hydrostatic, magnetic, and then we will go fully into, into the ideas behind Maxwell's demon and various incarnations. So this is really, the second half is going to be a lecture about demons and, uh, and Lucifer's and stuff like that. I know some of you like this kind of stuff. So, uh, so and, and you will see how, how this will develop there nicely. And of course, the, some of us more than us. And of course, uh, quantum demons will be the ultimate demons where, where, where we can apply to the stuff that we learned and see whether something comes out. And there will be a little bit of a surprise here, actually, um, uh, which, which I don't know what it tells us, but I will tell you what the surprise is, and I don't know how to resolve it myself. Um, and, and that's what I said yesterday, that, that another way of, of talking about, you know, imagine, imagine that you are, you are God, 
Or the other example was imagine you have a, a nice Cuban cigar and a, and a glass of whiskey with you and you're sitting and thinking about the world and you're creating the world, okay? And you say, well, what's the reasonable set of assumptions I should be doing and, and somehow second law occurs to you as a reasonable uh, principle. Then once you buy this law, you've already constrained yourself quite a lot. You can't now say, oh, let me have waves and let me have particles and let me have this and that. No, it's already fixed, actually many of these features, and that's very surprising. Well, to me, it's, it's surprising. So th the logic is somehow I buy one of those things, like the second law, and then a bit more. And you will see what a bit more is in each of these different instances. And what follows is things like light must be a wave. So even though you have a detector there that tells you click every time you have a photon, you actually cannot get away with explaining this fully as a bunch of particles. We know this when you go back to the history and Newton thought it was a particle, Huygens thought it was a wave, and then Young came along with his double state experiment and the whole, you know, the whole story back and forth. But actually, a guy called Gabor, who incidentally invented holography, he's a Nobel laureate for inventing uh, holography, um, he came along at some stage and said, well, you, it actually has got to have a wave component because otherwise you can violate the second law. This is this Lucifer guy there because, of course, it works with light. But um, one, another argument, uh, I think we heard it already, is, is that you have to have quantum superposition. So there was this guy called Lander who, who argued that second law already implies some kind of uh, superpositions. Then there is a very beautiful example by a guy called Bondi. Herman Bondi is a, is a kind of, well, I guess, originally German, but really British, ultimately, physicist who um, who is one of those guys who strongly opposed the Big Bang theory, by the way. He believed in the steady state uh, uh, theory of, of, of the universe. This one has nothing to do with that. It's just a cute um, gravitational Maxwell's demon. And it's very interesting to see where this guy fails and why it fails. And, and he has a really beautiful example there. Um, then I, I promised probably something that's the most surprising thing there, that it seems that you may be able to derive the full Einstein's field equations for general relativity fully from the second law. Well, not, I mean, you know, when I say, exactly, when I say plus a little bit more, I mean, you will see how little this little <laughs> is uh, up there. You have to be very careful because, because uh, with these kind of arguments, the field equations themselves are already very much constrained on its own, mathematically speaking. It's probably the, the first simplest guess that you would make. Um, uh, given some symmetries that you already possess. So, so you know, that you, could, you could argue quite a bit about it. And then this last bit is the whole of a bound. What I said limits the amount of information that we can have ultimately in quantum mechanics. And this guy is also constrained by the second law, but that's where the surprise is going to be. It's not constrained enough. And I don't know why it's not constrained enough. There is a gap. And is that telling us something? I have no idea. But you can, you can go and speculate uh, wildly about it, if you like. Anyway, here is <laughs> here is a very cute one. Before Newton, okay, this was uh, uh, I think uh, this guy Stevin is a, is a 16th century Dutch Dutch guy, who uh, I think this was around about the Galilean times, and I guess Kepler was there. But the full uh, mechanics was not developed uh, uh, until Newton uh, in the 17th century. And so this guy simply said, look, you know, I've got four of these equally massive uh, balls here, and I've got only two here. So the gravity surely is stronger here because this is more massive and this machine has got to do something like that forever, okay? Now, obviously, he probably made the machine, it never moved, and he didn't understand, or maybe he didn't understand why it didn't move. Uh, but this is the first time that you realize that a force is actually a vector. And, and of course, it's to do with the inclination of this triangle and the fact that you have to look at the component of gravity moving in this direction. If you do it properly, you will see that there is an equilibrium there, obviously. So, so, you know, this is how people were starting to learn about classical mechanics, by simply saying, look, I mean, this machine should work. It's a very simple argument. And then you discover that it doesn't work, and then you discover something about classical uh, forces and things like that. But it's a really cute example. There's zillions of these examples. Um, and people really made them frequently and displayed them in public and so on. Here is, a, here is a more interesting one, a water machine. I think this is the one that was made initially. So basically, I've got a bunch of boxes. Uh, and the same number of boxes here and here. 
uh, but these guys are immersed into some kind of water. So um, all of them suffer gravitational forces downwards, that's clear, in, in, to the same degree. But these guys have something that's called buoyancy pressure, Archimedes, right? I mean, it's pushing them up. The guys on the other side don't have the same uh, buoyancy pressure pushing them up. And so it's clear uh, <laughs> that uh, this whole machine should actually move like that as well, okay? Forever. Uh, perpetual motion, and and of course, I think if you if you look at it for for a few seconds more, you will you will figure out that problem. Um, of course, you discover uh, that there is an issue uh, when this box tries to squeeze into the water there and cross the boundary between the air and the water. And if you do this properly, you will see that the energy that's required to do that, of course, kills you, and, and this is never going to work uh, properly. So. But it's a cute idea. It's really a nice attempt. Uh, it does make sense when you look at it initially and so on. Um, here is a really cute one, magnetism. It links to, uh, to our discussions of, uh, of magnetic uh, properties and, and how we can detect them and so on. And this one is really cool. Okay? Here is, a, here is a, an elevated magnet up there, if you like. Uh, and here is another one, or an iron ball, or whatever you like. So the magnet is pulling this guy upwards. And the guy comes to a hole, and then it slides, falls down, and because the height from which it falls is greater than this height, it should have enough energy to go all the way back up and complete the whole cycle and do it over again, okay? <laughs> I'll leave you to figure out where this is wrong, because it's kind of obvious that it's never going to work out like that. So you see, somehow you're combining magnetism and gravity. I mean, you know, this is really interesting how people try to beat something that's, you know, how unobvious it is that you, should, that you shouldn't actually be getting uh, something from nothing. It's still not clear to us. There is still a residual psychological component that says to us, if I think a bit harder, <laughs> surely it's going to work forever like that, okay? You know, the, the economy will grow forever, for example, and things like that. But we physicists know that it doesn't quite work like that. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, so Maxwell's Diva, Maxwell was the first person to really look at it from the microscopic perspective. And his key input was, was it's really to do with, with some kind of information. How much information can you cash in? And for some reason, there is always a trade-off. And there's always a, uh, a bound uh, on, on the work that you can get given the, uh, the amount of information you have. And, and you cannot beat, it's just, it's always there. Uh, so Maxwell's demon is, you know, one way of talking about it, and I think that's the Max, uh, Maxwell's original way of talking about that is, I've got this small creature, and the creature really is trying to get non-equilibrium out of equilibrium, um, which, which relates to all of the machines that we had before. So basically something, equilibrium means you really have zero free energy, you have no, no potential, no capacity to do work. But if I can create non-equilibrium, using some kind of intelligence like this guy, then I should be able to basically, I should be able to convert then a non-equilibrium state into equilibrium. So his, his idea was I put all the hot atoms on one side of the room and all the cold on the other, and then I use the temperature gradient and the motion of the atoms to, to drive some kind of engine. Um, and, and he was bothered by that. He didn't really, he, I mean, he didn't know. I, I, I can't say that we know, actually, more than he does in some sense. We can just rule out certain things, but it, it still is a valid idea um, in many ways. So he somehow was bothered that, that if you have intelligence and if you are small, uh, then you can, you can easily violate the second line. He didn't like that. Um, okay, and, and, and so I said something like, this should be impossible, and I think he said it should be something uh, limiting that, but he wasn't sure what it was. And here is the first guy who made it to convert it into something that looks familiar to us now. So here is a simple example. People have written zillions of papers about it. There's still a controversy about it. Whether this solves the, the demon or it doesn't or whatever else is there and, and, and where is the price we pay and so on. So it's still very much a live field. So Schiller was one of those guys who, uh, who ran away from the Nazis. Um, he was Hungarian. He, he then uh, hopped across the pond to the States, and then he worked on the Manhattan Project. He was one of the most prominent physicists there uh, making the bomb. Uh, he apparently always lived in a hotel room with a, uh, with a fully packed suitcase, just in case if America becomes uh, 
dictatorial as well that he can escape that country as well. So he was always on the go, always wary about, uh, about uh, the society that he lives in. Anyhow, his idea was the following. He said, imagine I have a box and think about it as a single atom box. Because if you have n atoms and providing that they don't interact with each other, then, then it's just multiplied by n, whatever I tell you here. So you don't need to worry about, about more than one atom. Of course, it's very unrealistic in practice that you will have engines maybe only with one atom. But if you go again to bio biological systems, then actually you do get engines with maybe three or four atoms pushed across certain kind of membranes and then getting chemical potential difference and, and doing work. And that's actually most of biological energy, how it's created. So there is really Maxwell's demon in, in each one of us or in each of our cells. Uh, working in this way to, well, uh, an unsuccessful one, was the not, not successful one of these. Um, so here is a box which is like a memory unit, and Sheila said, here is a Maxwell's demon, I can violate the second law. And so he really tried to implement Maxwell's idea. And he said, okay, I've got an atom that's on the left and on, or on the right, so it's a little bit like an equilibrium situation. I don't know where the atom is. If I knew where the atom is, I would know exactly how to use it to do uh, one unit of work, but because I don't know where it is, I can't do much. And then, and then he said, well, why don't I learn where the atom is? So first I put a partition in, and the partition shouldn't change anything. This is one of those very funny, provided that it's thin enough. So all of the usual physics assumptions, you know, that the horse is a sphere, and the other unrealistic ones, so to speak, will occur in this model. But you can see where we're, where we're coming from. Basically, you insert this partition very quickly. You know, here you have entropy of one log log two units, if you like. When you put the partition, you still have exactly the same entropy. Unless the partition is wide and you're excluding certain space. You're not excluding anything now by doing that, really. This has no consequences in terms of entropy. And then, and this is, this is one of those places where you start to get a bit nervous, maybe, then this unit here, the memory, records the position of the atom. So you have some kind of demon here sitting, some kind of computer, if you like, which, which gains one bit of information and says, I now know that the atom is actually on the right, it's not on the left. And what you can do then is bring in the piston from the left. And again, in the usual physics assumption, this requires no amount of work. So this piston is infinitely light, and I'm pushing it infinitely slow. I mean, typical thermodynamics, right? It's, it's a lot, okay? I can, I, can, I, can, I can make it go for So I push it, so it's very important that I know that I'm not pushing it from the side where the atom is because I'll be working against the atom moving around, and that's why you need the information. And then you remove the partition, which anyway doesn't cause anything, and now you let the guy basically simply, you know, the guy is in, in thermal contact with some heat bath here supplying uh, energy, and the, because of this motion of the atom, this piston is pushed out and you get one unit of, of work out. Uh, and, and then, look, the, the atom is exactly now in the same unknown state. I no longer know where it is, on the left or on the right. I've got one unit of work, and nothing else has changed. So, Schiller looked at this in some sense and said, oh my god, I violated the second law of thermodynamics, where the second then shouldn't be the case. And now you look at it backwards and you say, I've got six places where I could have gone wrong. So which is which of the six places, okay? And you toss a coin, you throw a die, I suppose, in this case, and he says it's number three. Uh, why? Because it's the only place where I've actually really uh, had to do something unusual in the sense that I have to really interact between the atom and this memory unit to see the position of the atom. And you'll see actually on the next slide or the one after um, how you can maybe try to explain this generation. So Shilat said, clearly what this tells me is that any observation has to generate entropy. Um, and this was disputed later. So the big development that came later is, is by a guy called Bennett, Charles Bennett from, from IBM, who kind of showed that you can actually make this fully reversible. And one way of, of, of seeing that is that the entropy of each of these guys afterwards is really one unit because each of them could be either left or right and this guy could be either left or right, I mean R or L symbol there which is, which is log two units of entropy but they are correlated fully so whenever this guy is on the right, this guy is R and whenever you have L here, this guy is on the left 
which means that the total entropy is also one unit. So you're not really increasing the total entropy. And unless you're careless, maybe you should be able to do this without any entropy increase. That was Bennett's point. And when Bennett looked at it, he said, what you didn't do and what you forgot to do is to erase this guy R here. Because imagine now the demon wants to continue and get another unit of work from the whole, from the whole, from the whole thing. Then this me memory here has to be reset to some value, empty or whatever is your, your initial state. And then only then you can actually use it to write again uh, the position for the next cycle. So in a way, his, his claim was it's in the erasing of this bit of information that I, that I actually gain, I, I gain extra entropy in the universe and that's what saves whatever this word means, the, the second law. So somehow the, the contest is really between position three and position six. And I think in reality actually it's both of these that are really going to cause trouble to you. And you can probably vary the degree to which they cause, uh, cause the trouble. But that's the basic idea. This guy, this guy invented a bit in many ways. He, he actually talked about bits on the left and on the right. Shiva, this was well before Shannon. In fact, Shannon was familiar with this kind of stuff and, and I think it, uh, it influenced him quite a bit. Anyway, why does, um, let's discuss, let's discuss this, um, this a little bit more. So Shiva, Shiva basically said, I assume second law and then I conclude that something must be um, uh, causing the increase in entropy and he said, the most obvious one is that when I make a measurement, I have to increase the entropy. And you see, this links to all sorts of other discussions. That's why it's an interesting topic, because frequently people talk about the error of time being the same as the error of entropy. So the fact that whenever we make a measurement and look at something, this guy seems to claim that I have to always lose one, one bit of heat, somehow implies certain directionality to the processes in the universe, even though the underlying dynamics may be reversible. And then I mentioned that Bennett, you can read about his ideas in, in Feynman's lectures on computation, actually. Feynman talks quite a lot about him. He, uh, funnily enough, calls him always Dr. Bennett. He says, Dr. Bennett's machine. Because in the literature, you never really use the title of the person you're referring to. You would say Bennett's machine. But my understanding is that Feynman was a professor, and Charles Bennett will never be a professor because he works for a company. They don't have professorial titles. He will always be a doctor. So I think he deliberately uh, used this uh, many times during his lectures. It always makes me smile at it. Anyhow, the, the, the question now is, can we go a little bit into a more concrete example and, and see where this increase would be during, uh, uh, due to the, the measurement, OK? Um, so Gabor came along, and when he was thinking about holography, I think these are some of the ideas that he was thinking about at the same time. Um, and, and here is what, what he did. He said, here is, here is the box. Here is Schiller's box, if you like. And here is this atom that can be anywhere in the box. But what I want to do is I want to, I want to localize it into one part of the box. You know, you can either close the piston then and use the atom to do the work. But once I show you that I can localize it without any entropy increase into one part of the box, I've already showed you how to create a non-equilibrium situation and, and violate the second law. So the key thing is, can I really, by using light in this case, obviously, can I see where the atom is without, without increasing heat? And once I see where the atom is, I'm done. Because the initial entropy would be the log of the whole volume here but the final entropy would be the log of this small chunk and basically I would reduce it for free without any extra cost and now I can do something with that. It's exactly Maxwell's image. So his idea is let's put some kind of optical cavity around. Let's have some radiation bounce around. And, and let's have a photon. And here is where he was trying to say that if you had a photon, you could genuinely beat the second law. So if you had a photon, it's a particle not a photon as a quantum mechanical object because that's also a wave, of course. But if you really had a photon as a particle in the Newtonian sense of the particle, then this guy could bounce off and go into some kind of detector that would click. And this guy clicks only, only in the lower part because the cavity is centered only around this lower part. And somehow your entropy increase, like I said, would be, would be equal to this quantity here. So, it's very difficult to explain with particles. If you really think of these guys as billiard balls, if you like, and you're thinking, where does the entropy increase uh, 
come from. It's difficult to think of it because you can think of the collision being elastic, not producing any heat, maybe detection then being, uh, being very efficient and so on. Um, and so Schiller said, what this really forces me to think of is, is of, of this radiation as, as made up of, of, uh, uh, of waves. And here is the very simple argument that he, he then puts forward. He says, assume I have waves in this box. L is now the, the length of the, of the box, if you like. So basically, we know that if we have the length L, you can have different, um, different wavelengths of light uh, that you can set up inside, different modes of light, if you like. So twice the, the length of the box, the length of the box, 2L over 3, and so on. So it's 2L divided by N, where N is, N is an integer. Uh, and, and so we all know that. And it goes up to some number m. And the question is, if I want to objectively, and this goes back to our diffraction uh, grating thing and having an atom uh, going through a diffraction grating, if you want to, if you want to observe this guy, um, but if you want to be sure where the atom is in the box, then the minimum wavelength you should be using is 2 times L1. L1 is the, is the height of the smaller part of the, of the box. Why? Because anything smaller would actually produce a momentum kick in the atom which is much larger than the size of the small box. And so basically it's a little bit like Heisenberg's microscope. You observe the guy, but the guy has got so much kick from the observation that it's now sitting in the wrong part of the volume. So you can't do anything about it. You lost the information already about the whole thing. So his logic is, I need waves to balance of this atom, but they can't be too energetic. They can't have too high a momentum because otherwise I'm going to lose the information. The momentum should be low. And that tells you that the number of, of waves you can have, uh, this m, is just equal to the ratio of these two, which is the same as the ratio of volumes. And I'm using the length to represent basically the volume of this guy. And then he says, let me see how I can do that. I have a pulse laser of some, of, some, of some type. I mean, this was before lasers. This was 1940. Um, and basically, I have some kind of waves of certain uh, width and, and certain uh, duration, if you like, between the, between the waves. And then he says, um, it's clear that if my atom is going to be spending this much time in the lower volume, so if, if it really moves randomly, then this is the ratio of the times it will be spending in the big volume versus small volume, which means this is how frequently I have to observe this guy to make any sense out of it. Okay? So that's another constraint there, that I should be sending pulses as frequently in some sense as I think the atom is there. And now he says, let me calculate the entropy increase from my collision of the, of the, of the light, basically the photon pressure, if you like, light collision with the atom. And he says the entropy increase per mode, per wavelength, is simply the heat change divided by temperature. And the heat change is half kT, so he works fully with the, with the classical statistical mechanics, half kT per degree of freedom, per wavelength, if you like. Half kT, then he multiplies it by the number of these guys that you had and divides by the temperature. And when you, when, you, when you convert that, you know, when you plug this guy, the volumes here, and when you multiply the whole thing by M, you get that the entropy changes Boltzmann's constant one-half the ratio of the volume squared. So that's how much heat, in a sense, or entropy you have to generate if you're observing your atom under, under these conditions of, of, uh, of wave-like uh, probes. And, and of course, then he goes on and says, well, due to concavity of, uh, of, of the log function, this quantity here, half x squared, if you like, is always, is always bigger than half log of x squared itself. So I guess you, you see where this is coming from, that, that he's got something like one half x squared is greater than one half log x squared, okay? So this is, this is your entropy increase in reality, and this is your decrease um, of entropy in, uh, due to observation. And, and, and therefore, he says this formally proves uh, the second law, because it shows you that you cannot, you always have to lose more heat than you actually gain in terms of entropy. So, you know, turning this upside down, the way he argued is that if, if, if light was really made up of particles like Newton thought, 
uh, you could not you could not explain this. Where, whereas, if you introduce the wave light component, then you don't have a problem in the second law. So this also argues that light has to be a particle in a way at the same time. You know, it does have certain uh, germs of, of quantum mechanics as well. It's, it's not a difficult argument. Um, and then I think we covered already this. So I don't need to really talk uh, uh, at length about it, but. Lander was saying there is a paradox called Gibbs paradox where if I mix two different gases, the entropy increase by, increases by a finite amount. Whereas if I mix the same gas on the left and on the right, uh, uh, nothing happens. It's a little bit like in the, in the Schillard engine when I introduce the partition, I don't change the entropy of the system because it's already on the left and on the right simultaneously. There is no change in entropy. Uh, and so Lander says, well, it's a bit funny that um, that uh, either I get no change or I get one bit of uh, entropy change. And he said, shouldn't I have something in between these two values? And then you can only get, if you, if you could have partial indistinguishability of atoms on the left and on the right. And partial indistinguishability is not possible. I have to be also careful with, with this. It's not ultimately fundamentally possible in classical physics. Of course, it's possible in phase space if you're thinking of, uh, of a distribution. Uh, of a distribution of particles uh, like that and another distribution like that, then you have a region where you don't know which of the distributions you have. But if you really look ultimately at every individual particle, you don't have any, any problems with that. So Lambda says, this to me says that, that I need superpositions ultimately. Okay, um, this is nothing really to do with the second law in any obvious way because both of these comply with the second law. And any number in between would actually also comply with the second law. So in some sense, uh, we need something better. That's what I'm going to try to, to produce in a, in a second. Here is the cute bonding idea. It really is very cute. It actually, the first time I saw it was in a book about time. And like I said, this mystery of, of always having to pay the price for doing work is very similar to the mystery we have about understanding time. What is the error time? What is time? Is there time, actually? And things like that. I think these are very beautiful questions. Um, certainly much more important if you go into, into things like uh, general relativity. Uh, OK, so his machine is like that. I've got a bunch of atoms on a conveyor. It's always the same conveyor belt, OK? So if you are trying to violate it, try something like that, obviously. So there's a conveyor belt, and each of these guys has a two-level atom inside, OK? And what he says is, he says, these guys here are excited on the right-hand side. And these guys here are in the, in the ground state on the left-hand side. So he says, imagine that at this stage, the atom is excited, but somehow you stimulate the emission of, the, of, of, of a photon. So the electron goes down to the ground state, the photon is emitted under very controlled. I mean, no one can really make this machine in practice uh, currently. And then the photon goes out, bounces of two mirrors, goes up to this atom here, which then comes de-excited, but gets excited because it absorbs this photon here. Now, we know from relativity that um, more energetic things are more massive. So the electron being in a higher energy state implies that the atoms on the right-hand side are heavier you know, E equals MC squared kind of logic, and the atoms on the left-hand side. So therefore, this guy should go forever like that. So the photon emitted absorbed there, so you always maintain the, the imbalance between the heavy guys and the, and the light guys. And you say, where is the problem? And what this led him to conclude is that as the photon is climbing the gravitational potential, it's got to be changing its frequency. And when it gets up here, it cannot no longer be absorbed. It's not on resonance anymore. And I wonder if you really tidy this up properly, whether you can get the exact amount of the gravitational redshift. So the only possibility why this is going to fail, and we know that it should fail because we trust the second law of thermodynamics very strongly, is, is that the photon must be changing its color somehow. So it's not going to be. Uh, possible to absorb it with the unit efficiency out there. It's a really cute example, I think. A highly non-obvious one in, in, in many ways. And, and of course, now I'm going to upgrade this cute example to something, uh, something much more stunning in some sense. And I'm just summarizing. If you really want to 
know more about it, I really recommend that, that you download. It's one of the highly cited papers in, in that field, I think. It's a guy called Ted Jacobson. And Jacobson wrote a paper in a deliberately controversial way, the way that I like to write papers just to make other people angry. Because you want to stimulate debate and provoke it, otherwise we are not really doing science. We are stand collecting as well. So basically, what Jacobson said is, I'm going to actually claim that Deuteronomy Honda is gravid, because gravity doesn't really exist on its own. It's an outcome of something else, and what it is. So he says, I actually think that the field equations of Einstein's are simply the fundamental equation of thermodynamics, that the change in heat is simply temperature times the change in entropy. Why? And his argument uses, he basically puts together a number of other ideas that existed uh, at, at that time. So his idea is only to put it together into an equation like this. Everything else really comes from other people in some sense. So the first connection is that the entropy change is really proportional to the area. Of the system, so if you, you know, if you have a if you have a part of your um, space time somehow cut off from another part, for God knows what reason, you draw a line there and you say, I'm going to look at the flux of heat across this boundary. I call it the horizon because of the black hole kind of horizon idea, but it doesn't have to be. And he now looks at the transfer of of, of heat across this area. Then the entropy is really, and I think the evidence for that comes from quantum mechanics, and we discussed it a little bit, that, that the entropy uh, should be proportional to area because it's actually to do with the entanglement between the inside and the outside of this space-time. So that means the entropy of the outside and inside have to be the same, and the only thing that they have in common is the area. So it's a well-established law which has nothing to do, per se, with gravity. It really, you, you should be able to prove it in, in flat space-time, if you like, uh, with quantum field theory. So he assumes that. He says, Bekenstein tells me that this is the case, and I'm going to assume it. Then he says, this heat here is nothing other than the energy-momentum tensor, the total energy uh, that I have in a, given, in a given volume. And then he uses the idea from, from, uh, from accelerated observers, basically. This is this famous Unruh effect that an accelerated observer should see a certain temperature which is proportional to his acceleration and the temperature scales in some way like that. And then he says, if I plug these guys into the formula here, the temperature out there, the heat and the entropy, and I cancel all of these guys, I'm actually getting Einstein's field equations. Um, and, and so what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that gravity should not be quantized in the same way that, uh, that the um, wave equation of sound should not be quantized. The atoms are already quantized and they are interacting, and that's the sound. You don't need to put anything quantum on top of it. So his logic was like that. It's already there if you assume thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. It's a very powerful statement. So his, his statement is don't quantize gravity. Get a job. Change your field. Okay? That's why it's a little bit more controversial as, uh, as a paper. But I think that's the gist of the argument. I think if you want to know more, go to, I think it's a 1995 uh, PRL. Um, okay, let's, let's finalize now with the quantum ideas. Von Neumann was the first guy to use uh, some kind of quantum thermodynamics, and that was really interesting. And I think if you want to read more about it, read Asher Perez's beautiful book um, on, 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 quantum, on quantum mechanics, but from kind of our perspective of, of quantum information in many ways. Their idea was like this. If you could fully discriminate non-orthogonal states, so if you have some kind of nonlinear process, if you like, you should always be able to violate the second law by using this. And I'm going to show you a machine that does that, a very similar engine to Schillard's engine. Um, and, it, and it assumes this impossible element to show you that, it, that, that you can then violate the guy. So imagine you start with a system which exists in two non-orthogonal states. So this arrow up is like the uh, vertically polarized photon, and the and the, uh, and the and the horizontal arrow would be something like 45 degrees in this language. So this is a block sphere uh, representation. So these two states are not orthogonal uh, to each other. And then you have this what I call MM, the magic membrane, which of course doesn't exist. So you assume that this membrane here somehow is so magic that as you move these guys along like that, that's what I'm going to be doing now. Um, one of these states 
never crosses to the other side, the magic membrane, but the other one does. So the membrane can tell two non-octagonal states apart. Of course, that's exactly where the trouble is going to be. And I want to show you that this, is, this cannot be done, or should not be possible. Now you get work out of that. How? By simply allowing this guy to push against this membrane and this guy to expand against this membrane. The same logic as in Schiller. So basically you can get one unit of, of, of work out of it because half a unit is picked up by this guy and half a unit by that guy. And now they occupy the whole box. <coughs> okay? Um, and now what you do is you use your magic membrane again and you say now I'm going to let the guy come back to the other side for free because the membrane doesn't allow the other guy to go. You see, the membrane is your Maxwell's demon, which can, which can actually discriminate non-orthogonal quantum states for free, okay? And then, and then, and then I, once I have this, basically, this is the same. Now I'm going to decompose this state in, in its eigenstates. So it's going to be like 22.5 and minus 22.5, two orthogonal states if you diagonalize this S in ages. Um, and basically, if you look at this state, now you can go always with a normal membrane, no magic membrane needed, into, into one guy, because they're orthogonal states. One guy on one side, the other guy on the other side. And suddenly now you've gone, you've gone, you've gone into the original situation with far less work needed. So it's temperature times the entropy of this mixed state, if you like. Uh, which is far less than the amount of work that you got in general because the original work is one unit of work. And this entropy, because they are not orthogonal, is going to be less than one unit. So the logic is if you, if you look at the work in and the work out, it seems that I'm getting more work out than work in if I can discriminate non orthogonal quantum states. And I'm not paying any other price. So this was their logic why you shouldn't have. And this also relates to the impossibility of nonlinearity in, in, uh, in, in Schrodinger equation and stuff like that. And now we're almost at the end. So, so if you want to read a little bit more about all of these guys, there is this review that I mentioned that I think came out uh, either last year or this year. It's a recent one, within last uh, last year, where we really tried to collect uh, all of these Maxwell's demons and, and show the logic and, and, and try to argue against them and so on. So now, the, the interesting aspect, and, and, and that's really, that's a bit surprising to us, was that what we did is instead of using one, um, one atom with two uh, non-orthogonal states, we tried to use any density matrix here with any number of mixed states, and see what happens uh, if we assume membranes that can actually discriminate all of these density matrices. So we wanted to see how far can we push the discrimination before we violate the second law, and we constructed the cycle. And what's interesting, so I don't want to really bore you with the details of the cycle, but what's interesting is that the information that we got out is equal to the whole of a bound, which we were hoping to get for free out of this. But then there was always an extra entropy that you cannot erase under most general circumstances. So actually, it seems to, unless, unless all of the states commute with each other, in which case you have the classical physics scenario, so it's not quantum anymore. So in the general quantum physics scenario, there is an extra element that you have to pay the price if you, if you are running this kind of cycle quantum mechanic. And of course, you can see that this leads to all sorts of speculations that you can, that you can introduce there. And one of them is maybe this is telling you that, that, uh, that you can actually do better than quantum mechanics. Maybe this is telling you that there is really an extra bit here which you can fill with a, with a theory that can do better than quantum mechanics, but still saturate the bound. So this bound is in a way too loose as far as quantum mechanics is concerned. And I think that's the, that's the latest statement that we were able to make uh, on this kind of stuff. Um, and, and, I think, and I think more or less this is, this is kind of a, a summary of, of, of another aspect of the outlook where, where people are going. Uh, but basically, and I think that's another area where people feel that Maxwell's demon now becomes, uh, becomes much more relevant and, and even more difficult to refute. So the general logic is that if information really tells you about the work that you can do, then the question is, are we always right to live and exist within the Shannon formulation? I think this goes back to the very beginning of the course where I was arguing that Shannon's entropy is the most logical way of, of quantifying information. 
However, if you really talk about small numbers of systems and you're not in the thermodynamical limit, then there are all sorts of generalized entropies which are only equal to Shannon in a very special case. And there is now a field developing which says maybe we should talk about finite thermodynamics and see what kind of laws we have there. So it could be that this discrepancy I was talking about before uh, could arise sometimes from the fact that you are not really accounting for your information properly. You're thinking of information as, as uh, asymptotic uh, quantity and additive, but maybe you shouldn't be thinking of, of this in that way. And there's lots of work in, in uh, certainly biological systems trying to argue that now you should be modifying your thermodynamics and no longer using it uh, in that direction. Um, so, so that's now one of the questions that emerges uh, that emerges from uh, from that, which is which is what exactly is the is the most general formulation of, of the relationship between information and work. When I talk about any scenario that I like now, I don't have to maybe repeat my process many times. I may not have a large number of particles. Maybe it's a single shot process, um, and and is there. A, is there a general way of talking about, about the second law within this scenario? And you can see why this is going to be important for living systems because they usually have very small resources and they have a finite time during which they, they have to do something. So they can't use the thermodynamic logic. And then some other ideas, for example, can, the, can, can you convert the whole formulation into some kind of dynamical formulation? And can you, can you upgrade entropy? These are the ideas that a guy called Tom Toffoli started to exploit some 30 years ago, but I haven't seen anything, anything, anything fully worked out in that direction. So basically, if you think of entropy and work being your, your um, thermodynamical quantities, what about thinking of action and computation in some sense being your dynamical equivalents? So once I understand this connection here between information and work, can I then apply that to some kind of action and computation? So this is the things that we've been discussing and saying if I give you, um, if I give you this, much, this many units of entanglement, if you like, how much computation can you do there? So can I use the same formula now? This would be something like the weak rotation for those of you who know what this is. Converting the temperature into time, if you like, and, and, and upgrading these quantities there. And there are some ideas in that direction. And it would be very nice to have some very general bounds of this physical um, type. So I think that's all for me. I'm going to stop here. And I think, as usual, you feel free now. We have lots of time, so feel free to ask as many questions as you like. Um, and, and then we get yeah, at 7 o'clock, I guess, is the fixed one. How about the Gibbs paradox? And if you have a particle that doesn't have a spin, how does it? It's, it's, because it's easy to, to say that you, you must have superposition to, to have a continuous transition from. Yeah. So you're asking you're asking what what's going to be my um, what's going to be my my degree of freedom that's going to label the particle in some sense and, and makes it uh, indistinguishable or distinguishable from the other particle. I agree. It has to be some kind of internal state. Uh, it doesn't have to be spin, but then you have to use maybe energy or whatever else you have internally, like the position of the electron in the inside the atom or things like that. You can use all of these. If you have no degrees of freedom, then I think by definition they're indistinguishable. Then you're going to be in the regime where there is no increase in entropy. So you have to have an extra label, just as, as, as usual. Is this how it happened? I don't know if that a particle with a fundamental particle that doesn't have spin. Uh, well, okay, if it doesn't have spin, it's, it's going to have some other degree of freedom, like, uh, I, I don't know, like, yes, I mean, you could, you could imagine that uh, for photons you'd be talking about polarization, but you can say that's kind of the equivalent in some sense of uh, angular momentum or whatever else. Um, I think it's difficult to imagine that you have some particle that you fundamentally cannot, that's what you're getting at somehow. I have a particle that I cannot use any internal degree of freedom to somehow make it difference, different, and then I'm forced to have either nothing or either one, one unit of, uh, of this. It's difficult to think of. Yes, sir. But I guess you should, you should ask yourself the other way around, in a sense that if there exists at least one such particle, then suddenly I have to have superpositions, at least for 
prevent degree of freedom that would be physiology. So they may not be universal, but they must exist in some case. Yeah, about the argument about light, that it must be a wave. Yes. Why is it only valid for light? Why does this not imply that you can't have light? It's, a, it's a brilliant question, actually. It is really a brilliant question. Yes, this, this is a proof of the existence of gravitons without ever detecting the symbol of gravity. I, I agree with you fully. This is a proof that any entity in this universe has to be a way. Absolutely right what they're saying now. It was just written in 1940 when I think he didn't think about it and he was an optician. But I think you're absolutely right. This is not an argument for everything being a way. That's why I said that it has a germ of quantum mechanics. It forces you to acknowledge that it can't just be particles. I think you're it's, right. It's not a little strange in the argument. You, you suppose that there is a particle in box. It's not. Yes, so even this particle, the way you would have to argue is that this particle is, is, is you know, the wavelength is so small yes, that it's very well localized. And then you can say, okay, there is a certain extra contribution, but this I can make so minimal that it's not going to do the accounting for me. Yeah. But if I were to use it to observe other particles, then you, then you enter this kind of argument. Yeah. Could you explain uh, true photons matching? Uh, being splitter without uh, wa uh, wavy description? Um, okay, so that's, a, that's also a very good question. So can I explain Hongo Mendel kind of uh, uh, bunching of photons? That's what you're saying. I have one photon coming from each side, port of the beam split. And now you're saying, can I explain the fact that they interfere? at the output without, without um, I don't know. You know, some people would say path integral in some sense was invented to, to still retain the particle notion uh, of objects, but then say they are particles, but they explore all possible paths, which is actually another way of saying they are waves, you know, but without using the dirty word wave. So I, I agree with you. Already, there, there's many other instances where it would be very difficult to explain that without that way. Okay. Uh, you have to superpose all possibilities and I mean, you call that a way, but I do. So. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to use my box still. Uh, how should you able to take the loudest principle of continu continu continuity? Because there is a lot of uh, the, the, the expert phenomena. Well, is there any bad element where to apply it or not? Yes, no, that's a very good question, especially that, uh, that, uh, that I was I'm almost contradicting my, my previous statement that I didn't believe in continuity myself. <laughs> yes. Uh, you can have So you know, Oscar, Oscar Wilde said, the well-bred contradict others, the wise <coughs> contradict themselves. So that's the principle that I'm applying. I'm really contradicting myself very frequently now. I don't think I'm wise, but at least I contradict myself. I think you're right. If I, if I abolish continuity, you say maybe there is, even in quantum mechanics grounds, for saying that, that nature is discretized. And space-time, then you can say, well, maybe, maybe there is really the, the smallest unit of whatever, of, of, of any entity, in which case, how do you now reconcile this with, uh, with the superposition principle? So I agree with that as well. So his, his assumption is somehow that that you should be able to go continuously between between two orthogonal states. But the question is, would he, you know, would his logic still be correct even if you, your discreteness is now at some much lower scale? That's how you would have to think somehow. You would have to say, okay, I cannot discriminate all of these directions of the block vector, but they come in such small units that this is beyond my my abilities to discriminate. But I agree, this is not a fundamental argument in many ways. Yes, I understand. If you talk about charge, then it's uh, discrete as presumably, and yeah, so that's one of the robots that doesn't have this kind of uh, problem.
<laughs> I'm happy to talk at the party about this as well, by the way, but I, you should you should continue now. I'll be there. Okay, I'll do some for the end. Uh, the 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 Jacobson uh, oh, yeah. paper. Yes. Uh, and they said you don't have to contest gravity. You have to say that you 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 you. That's right. Now, yes, again, yeah. I wasn't contradicting myself. I guess Jacobson is contradicting Gabor in this case, so, so I'm out of the whole picture. But, uh, uh, but you're right, yeah. Here we have a wave example, and that's right. Yeah. No, but what, what do you think? Who, who, who's right? It's a very, I mean, one idea, one idea that I like extremely in, uh, in, in this is, is something linked to this Jacobson, which says it's called um, um, it's called something like, or it's called under various names, but the idea is really that the field theory itself, quantum field theory, um, gives rise to gravity on its own in flat space time. So the whole of curvature comes really from, from adding up all the quantum, all the quantum fields in, in, in some ways. So it's a little bit like, uh, like emergent uh, gravity. Uh, and, and, and you can do some, some nice calculations to show that you can really account uh, for, for the whole of general relativity by, by some kind of simple arguments of that type. I mean, I like, I like lots of these ideas where, where gravity somehow emerges. Here it emerges statistically speaking. Uh, in, in the quantum field theory case, it somehow emerges uh, more deterministic. It's not a statistical effect. Uh, but it is a residual energy. It's a little bit like the Casimir effect from all the fields inside a finite universe. And already there enough to account for, for all the relativistic, general relativistic effects. And there are lots of arguments like that. And it could well be that the fact that people haven't been able to quantize gravity just means that, um, that this is something emergent and not something fundamental. That would be interesting. Yeah, because then it make no sense to speak of gravity. Absolutely, absolutely. But, but if, you, if you think of it the other way around, if you, if you say this is a fundamental force, <coughs> the same way as, as others are, then I think it would be weird to have a universe where this force for some reason would not be quantized. So if this wasn't emergent, then I think it's just got to be quantized somehow. Mm -hmm. There's no other way, because you cannot consistently, you, you, I mean, you gather that I'm against this division between quantum and classical. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very, it's very difficult to make it consistent that part of your universe somehow doesn't conform. You know, how does it couple to others in the, you, you cannot even phrase that somehow. At some level, you have to admit that you're discovering the same universe. Yes. And you will have a rich paradox of that information also yes. at once. Yes. Do you have anything to say about it? About the information loss. Mm -hmm. So that's another, I mean, in a way, it, it emerged from lots of these black hole arguments. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if, if you come from, there is, a, there is a psychological bias to the whole thing. In the sense that if you come from quantum mechanics as we do, you tend to believe that it's actually going to be gravity that will have to be modified and fail at some level. Whereas if you come from the gravity direction, you know, people like Penrose and so on, they tend to believe the other way around. Mm -hmm. so, so if you really favor quantum mechanics, and if you say the whole thing has just got to be quantized, what that means is that paradox comes from the fact that it's a semi-classical description of, uh, of your system. You haven't fully quantized it. And once you have quantum gravity, it's going to be as reversible as, as any other quantum uh, theory. So I would say that's going to be the resolution if you quantize it. But otherwise, I think we have a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think two, two different that's why. That's it. It could be simply the friction between two things that are not compatible yet. Yeah. We stop? Okay, so any other questions? <coughs> so I think we should thank the person of the